Oh, hi. I didn't see you there. My name is Bliss Foster, and today we're going to be talking about anti-fashion, what it was and what it is now. I have a feeling that we're going to get a lot of people commenting on this video before they actually watch through it. A huge part of why I'm making this is to start discussion. I, I really do want to hear what you have to say about this. Recently, we did a video that talked a lot about avant-garde, and there's just a lot of terms in the fashion industry that get tossed around and people don't really give a whole lot of thought as to what would make that term useful for good conversation or what it just means in the first place. Anti-fashion is another really tricky one. I, I find that myself and a lot of other people tend to just point to a specific designer and say, this is anti-fashion, rather than trying to offer a definition definition, so that's what we're going to attempt to do here. To make everybody happy here, I think I do have a pretty easy definition, and it comes directly from the mouth of one of the few designers that we can almost universally agree is anti-fashion, Yoji Yamamoto. In the documentary Anti-Fashion in the 90s, Yoji Yamamoto is asked about the term and says, ugh, I hate this word, anti-fashion. All it means is just that you don't follow trend. And I think that definition does serve the purpose that most of us seem to be trying to use that term for, but it also creates a massive, massive problem. If we just look at the requirements that are laid out in that definition, the boxes that need to be checked, I don't think any designers meet those requirements anymore. There might be one designer, but we'll get to that in a second. Many people ask, Bliss, you're always talking about the Patreon. I don't even know what, what even that is. Patreon is just a way for you to give $3, $9, or $30 a month to the channel so that it can continue to run. YouTube ads make, contrary to popular belief, almost no money at all. The only way that I'm able to do this from a business perspective is because of people giving on the Patreon. You get lots of special stuff for signing up for the Patreon. It's definitely worth looking at. The clickable thing is somewhere on the screen right now. You should definitely click that and go look at it so that I can continue to do this. The channel is my only source of income. It would mean a lot if you supported me. Anti-fashion was a term that emerged a few decades ago at a time when trends were an important, crucial part of the industry, as opposed to now when trends are the industry. And there was something that changed that made it where trends went from being a separate thing that was within fashion to taking over the entirety of fashion. That change is a company called WGSN. To put it really simply, WGSN is a trend forecasting network. Fashion companies subscribe to their extremely expensive service and then WGSN tells them, this is what everyone will be wearing in two years. Does that sound impossible? It's really not. The team at WGSN is always very open and transparent about the fact that they have been wrong before about certain trends, but usually they're dead on. WGSN was founded in 1998. They became a pretty serious part of the industry in 2005, but they became a powerhouse and essentially changed fashion permanently in 2013. I swear this is related to anti-fashion, hang with me. The onset of trend forecasting basically collapsed anti-fashion because of its definition. As we're running through here, we're gonna watch runway footage so you're not just staring at me and my parents' house the whole time. So a few decades ago, many brands in fashion were dependent upon trends to make their money, but those trends were determined by this elite fashion cabal. It was a system of tastemakers that made subjective decisions and also enforced those decisions. This famous scene from The Devil Wears Prada is an excellent example of this. I don't want to be mean, but most of the fashion trend decision makers were either self-appointed or nepotistically appointed people who just had excellent taste that would just say, stripes are out, polka dots are in. Maybe these people had an art history degree, maybe they had a fashion degree, but mostly it was just rich, eccentric people who really liked the idea of being able to declare what the next thing in fashion was going to be. That was the way that it was, but it wasn't terribly effective. Those people were wrong all the time. They were very bad at guessing what the actual zeitgeist of the public wanted to go towards. Okay, so that's the way the industry used to be. Now with WGSN, trend forecasting is incredibly labor intensive work. WGSN has lots of different branches and services that they offer to all kinds of different industries, but as far as fashion is concerned, it's essentially a combination of super labor intensive street style work in major cities all over the globe, and then interpreting trends from luxury runway shows. These two pieces are analyzed and turned into reports by people who themselves are extremely plugged into the culture. And there's a lot of interchangeability. A lot of people that used to work at WGSN now work in the industry or in a publication and vice versa. Those two factors are interpreted by people who are very plugged into the culture that turn them into reports that then get sold out to fashion brands. Then just to be totally 
really clear WGSN is not a trend forecasting network they are trend forecasting there are technically other trend forecasting companies but that's kind of like saying there are other search engines besides Google they exist but their share of the market is so small that Google is search engine Google is search engine <laughs> The colors, the shapes, the finishing details, the marketing direction for different collections at every brand store at every suburban mall is determined two years in advance by one company. Before, trends were just guesswork from people with supposedly good taste. Now they are calculated, packaged, and delivered from a monolithic source. Because like, have you ever noticed how if you go into a mall, it just sort of seems like every store, even stores that you think of as being very different stores, having very different goals and selling to different people, how they all just sort of seem to be selling different flavors of the same thing. It just kind of seems like they're all talking to each other, right? Well, they're not. They're just all doing what WGSN tells them to do. Just to give you an example, this is what a WGSN trend report looks like from years ago. So before, rejecting trends meant that you were bucking up against this snotty cabal of people who were deciding what was cool and what wasn't cool. But now you're either, okay, hey, this is the really important part, stay with me. Now you are either following trends or you are trends. There is no way to get outside of that system. 50% of a WGSN trend report is just interpretation of runway shows. They watch what designers do on runway shows during fashion week, and then they interpret that into their report that is then given to Banana Republic or whoever. I don't think there is any anti-fashion left in the industry at all. Anti-fashion was designers like Rei Kawakubo and Yoji Yamamoto and Martin Margiela who were ignoring what those tastemakers in Paris wanted them to do and instead doing their own thing. But now, as many designers continue to want to try to do their own thing, the trend forecasters are at all of those shows taking notes and then interpreting that into you know, peplum tops or back or whatever. Okay, so what? Like, anti-fashion is dead now? Super discouraging. I'm wondering though, 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 I'm wondering if maybe just anti-fashion changed shapes. The introduction of WGSN made it where everyone was part of the trend machine, even if they were trying to not be. But I'm wondering, and I, I truly, I'm, I'm wondering. I want this to be a conversation. I'm asking the question. Has Demna figured out a way to sidestep that somehow? Because, I mean, like every other artist, Demna's work is multifaceted and it's very complex. It's not about one thing. But a distinct side of his work is him embracing fashion's detritus. <laughs> and I don't think it's any mystery that I like Demna's work a lot. I've covered it extensively to a lot of, well, okay. Let me give you an example and I think that'll clear it up. Something that WGSN fails to recognize in their reports about what people want in their clothes is that in 2018, well over a million people worldwide went out and proudly wore the t-shirt that they got for free for pre-ordering Call of Duty Black Ops 4. What WGSN fails to recognize about people's desires for their clothes is that worldwide, 30 million people have bought Snuggies. What WGSN fails to recognize is that everyone on earth went to high school with some weirdo who ended up buying this t-shirt. What WGSN fails to recognize is that countless men and women have bought these $30 cargo pants from Amazon. There's a distinct part of Demna's work that seems to be saying, if fashion is meant to be a reflection of the culture, then here. Take your shit back. He embraces the difficult truth that most people don't have bad taste, they just don't care. And I don't, don't say that to be insulting to Demna or to the people that he's kind of drawing inspiration from, but those people very truly, genuinely, we, we all know people like this, they truly, truly just don't care about what clothes they're wearing. Demna recognized that WGSN was saying, subscribe to our service and follow trends or become our measuring instrument for calculating those trends. And Demna chose instead to go towards the fearsome center, the eye of the storm, the reality of everyone's most basic carnal fashion desires, the undeniably huge populist side of fashion that WGSN chooses to ignore. And I don't wanna to sound too high-minded here, but this is what every great fashion designer has always done. They've looked to regular people for inspiration. What's different is that when we say that Cristobal Balenciaga looked to regular people for inspiration, it has the romantic sheen of the past. 
but it makes us uncomfortable. I mean, it makes me uncomfortable to know that there is a designer that is looking to ordinary people. And what he finds is that one in every 200 people on the whole earth own a Snuggie. 30 million Snuggies, 6 billion people. Sad but true. Anti-fashion at its most useful is a term that means a designer that has escaped the system. Is this what escaping the system means now? I really do want to hear your thoughts about this. I would really like some comments so that we can get some good discussion going. If you like conversations like this, if you really enjoy discussing the zeitgeisty nuances of what fashion means in the modern world, you really should get on the Discord. I know that a lot of people say that, oh, I don't want to like start up on another app or whatever. I promise you, this one is worth it. Go join the Patreon. That allows you to support the channel with a couple of bucks every month. You're able to make it so that this kind of stuff can exist. But one of the perks of that is that you get to be on the private Discord server. And I, I promise you, it is worth downloading a new app and getting into a whole different thing. It basically is just like a big fashion friends group chat where everyone is posting pictures and having really excellent nuanced discussions about this stuff. I realize that it's asking a lot, like go download Patreon, go download Discord. The support really does mean a lot to me, but also I really think you'd get a lot out of it. Go follow me on Instagram. To the eight people who stuck around to the end of this video, I greatly appreciate you. I love you infinity times infinity. Goodbye.